Greetings, brethren. My name is Chad Branton. I'm with the Continuing Church of God. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about failure and success. I want to ask you a seemingly silly question today. Could Jesus Christ have failed to become humankind's Savior? I'd speculate that uh, some of you have already answered that question in your minds. Now, we're all aware that He did not fail, but could He have? It's not my intention today to debate the question, but rather to investigate why or how He succeeded, and also to encourage us as Christians to see how we can succeed just as Christ did. One reason Jesus was successful was because He knew who He was, His identity. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This verse is referring to Jesus, says God. Now, verse 14 of that same chapter, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten of God. Jesus knew His identity. He knew who He was. And what it meant to be begotten of God the Father. Jesus also succeeded because He knew His mission. He knew what was expected of Him. He came to this earth with a purpose. Mark 1.38 says, But He said to them, His disciples, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And in Mark 10.45, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. Over in John, Chapter 6, verse 38, it reads, For I have come down from heaven, and this is Jesus talking, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And in John 18, 37, as Jesus responds to Pilate, Pilate says, Therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus came and fulfilled each of his objectives. But how? How was he? Was he successful just because he was the Son of God? No. Jesus was just as much human as each one of us in this room. He experienced every single emotion we do. Happiness, sadness, joy, sorrow, and even pain. Jesus was not a robot receiving orders. Because He was flesh just as we are flesh, Jesus can sympathize with our weakness and was just as susceptible to failure as we are. It says in Hebrews 4, chapter 14, Correction, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So no, Jesus was not successful just because He was the Son of God. Jesus was successful because He had faith in God. He trusted and obeyed God the Father to the point of perfect obedience. It says in Hebrews 5, verses 5 through 9, So also Christ did not glorify Himself to become high priest, but it was He who said to Him, You are My Son. Today I have begotten You. Verse 6 says, He also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, 
yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And although Jesus knew who he was and why he was sent, Christ could not have accomplished any of these things without love. Love is, is an extremely strong motivator. And because of his love for us, Jesus dedicated was dedicated to success, knowing that without love, he could not have succeeded. Jesus mentions in John 15, verse 13, the amount of love he has for us. John 15, 13 reads, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's what he did for us, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 2. Ephesians 5, 2 reads, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Well, you might say to me, well, Jesus was the Son of God, and I'm just a human. I'm imperfect, weak. Yes, we are imperfect. But does that mean we're not supposed to strive toward perfection? Are we not told in God's Word to strive for perfection? Jesus said in Matthew 5, in verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And in Hebrews 6, chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of the eternal judgment. We will not be perfected in the flesh, but we have to press on, as Paul mentioned in Philippians. Philippians 3.12 we read, Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me which is one of the reasons the ministry was put into place. Turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start reading in verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And this will be from the old King James Version. Verse 11 we read, And He gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Striving will not be easy, but trust that God inspired Paul to write in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can be successful as Jesus was, if we too know who we are, if we know our spiritual identity. But how does one know their spiritual identity? How do you know? It says in Romans 8, verses 9 through 11, if you want to turn there, Romans 8, Paul here writes in verse 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit if the Spirit of God is indeed dwelling within you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. But if Christ be within you, the body is indeed dead because of sin. However, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, Now if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling within you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies of His Spirit that dwells within you. So we as Christians are begotten of God. 
if we have truly repented and accepted Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, if we've been properly baptized and have hands laid upon us to receive God's Holy Spirit. Being begotten children of God, we have some of the same objectives Jesus had to teach about the coming kingdom of God, to teach obedience to the commandments. In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, here we have some of our objectives. Starting in verse 19 of Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And also in Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, you want to turn there, Luke 9. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. We are to live our lives as Christ and his apostles did. We've been given each of the same objectives and the tools we needed to achieve these goals. While we are on the subject of success, I'd like to read something from the autobiography of the late Pastor General of the Old Worldwide Church of God, Herbert Herbert Armstrong. In the sixth chapter of this original autobiography, Mr. Armstrong listed his seven success laws, and they can be applied both to your physical and your spiritual life. The first one is fixing the right goal and being fired with the ambition to achieve it. Avoid the square peg in the round hole pitfall. This is uh, Mr. Armstrong. Knowing that your purpose in life is both your overall purpose for being alive and your secondary goal of occupation or profession where you best fit. The second law of success, he says, adequate education or preparation for achieving that goal. This includes schooling, personality development, experiences. This autobiography you're reading is merely the account of my personal schooling and experiences in preparation for achieving the ultimate goal of which I was not so much as remotely aware during those formative years. Mr. Armstrong continues, number three is continuous good health. How can you succeed without it? This includes knowledge of food, diet, and the causes of sickness, disease, debilities, and impairment of health or e efficiency, and knowledge of how to keep at peak strength and mental alertness. The fourth law of success is drive, keeping a constant prod on oneself. The will to drive oneself on when he feels like letting down and taking it easier, making every minute and hour count. The lackadaisical seldom achieve big success. I've always found that the real successful men have driven themselves on to success. Mr. Armstrong's number five of his laws is resourcefulness. Resourcefulness. Keep the mind on the task at hand. Think. When obstacles arise, as they always do, we find a way around them. And I'll just add something here. Uh, over the years, I've been taught on occasions uh, through various uh, leaders that when you come upon a problem, you are to adapt, you are to improvise, and you are to overcome. And I still try to apply that when it's necessary. Anyway, getting back to what Mr. Armstrong wrote, keep a constant daily attitude of positive confidence. The sixth law of success is perseverance. <clears throat> The stick to itiveness. Avoid drifting, getting sidetracked off the main line. When the going gets real tough, when everybody says you're licked, don't quit and don't give up. This law includes determination, faith, assurance. Nine out of ten men having every other qualification for big success lose it because they quit just a little too soon. He continues, they lack the will to persevere. It's the same in the spiritual life of the real Christian. 
And here he quotes Matthew 24, 13. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And he continues, I must add, however, always be willing to give up when you're proved wrong. And the seventh law, he put last, but certainly not least, divine guidance. And while this placed last in time order, it is actually first in importance. Without it, you probably won't choose the right goal. You won't have the wisdom to acquire proper education and preparation, have good health, possess resourcefulness or wisdom to meet and conquer problems and obstacles, or have the inspiration for drive or the faith to persevere. He says the greatest sin of all is to have another true God, another God before the true God. Man's greatest supreme need is the guidance, the wisdom, the judgment, the faith, the power, and the love, the patience, and even working out of miraculously of circumstances on occasion that can come only from close, intimate contact with the true God. So, that was Herbert Armstrong from his book. So with all that in mind, I ask you each again, could Jesus have failed? Yes, he could have. But can we succeed? Yes, we can, each one of us. So by knowing who we are as begotten children of God and knowing that what is expected of us, however, we have to work harder at our objectives because most of us have to earn learn lies that have been taught and begin learning truth and discernment. But we can succeed if we apply these laws of success to our spiritual and physical lives if we make use of all of our resources and saturate our minds in God's Word, God's laws, and God's ways, and most importantly, if we have the faith to trust our, and obey our Heavenly Father, just as Christ did. To live by His every word and to love as we are commanded. I'd like for us to turn over to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll wrap up. 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Verse 5. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love never fails. So as you set your goals and work toward each one, remember the words of Solomon in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes and fear the Lord. Depart from evil. We'll close with Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Solomon writes, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Brother, don't give up. Don't lose heart. And you can succeed. Thank you. This is Chad Brandon. If you continue with Church of God.